Hello, welcome back. In today's video, we're going to go over how to invest in stocks and how to incorporate stocks into your personal portfolio. Let's get started. You'll be go we'll be going over different types of stocks. Uh, and the most important thing about stocks is understanding the trade off between risk and return. Uh, and then we also look at how analysts and professionals go about analyzing stocks. And in part in, if you are ready to place orders, they're important to know about different types of orders. Um, we will also look at the advantages and disadvantages of different types of investment strategies when you come to stocks. Finally, we're going to touch on um, other types of investments. These are called alternative investments. First, let's take a look at different types of stocks. Uh, common stocks, as the name implies, is the most common. Uh, common stock represents ownership in a firm, and as a owner of a, a shareholder, you are entitled to certain rights. One of those rights are to receive dividend. Uh, other rights may include voting uh, on important uh, company decisions. Uh, voting rights may entitle you to elect board of directors and also decide on important company policies, such as changing the bylaws. Uh, remember that companies, each company can have their own bylaws and they can be very, very different from company to company. And also uh, important uh, decisions such as mergers and acquisitions. Some companies have different classes of stocks, others only have one. When a company has different classes of stock, it's very important to know the specifics. That is because different classes of stocks may have very different voting rights. This is particularly common amongst technology companies. Uh, technology companies may have class A stock, class B, class C. Again, the, a, a class A stock for one company may be very different from a class A stock from another company. So knowing the details is important. Uh, there are technology company out there where some classes of stocks have no voting rights at all. And uh, other companies may have different classes of stock where one class of stock has each share will have 100 votes and other shares, other class will have only one vote per share. So details, details. Uh, there are also provisions that may allow one type of uh, one class of share to be convertible into multiple shares in another class. So again, there's no standard when it comes to stocks. Another type of stocks are called preferred stocks. These are much less common. Uh, preferred stocks, uh, they, the name prefer means that they uh, they get paid dividend before common stockholders can get paid dividend. So that's where the prefer comes, uh, the term prefer means. They get preferential treatment when it comes to dividend. However, preferred stocks typically do not have voting rights. The dividends for preferred stocks are typically fixed. Again, very few companies have preferred stocks. Uh, they, uh, utility companies are the most common. Uh, they are a lot more like bonds, uh, but the dividends can sometimes increase. So they, are, uh, so they have a little bit more opportunity for increase in dividend compared to bond uh, coupons. We already touched upon the corporate bylaws. Uh, every company has different bylaws. They specify the rights and responsibilities of shareholders. Again, there's no standard in corporate bylaws. Each company has their own bylaws, so it's important to pay attention to the differences. So when you purchase a share of stock, what can you expect to get? The return from investing in stocks comes in mainly two forms. The first is dividends. Uh, dividends, the, the way that dividends work is there's no guarantee. The board of directors has the right to declare dividends. Once the dividends are declared, then the companies are obligated to pay them. However, they are not required. The dividend, a lot of times, uh, dividends are expressed as a dividend yield. Um, that's defined, de, uh, defined as the dividend divided by the share price. So this is a return on the price that you pay on the stock as measured in dividends. In addition to dividend, the second type of return is capital gain, which is the difference between uh, your, the price you pay for the stock and the price that you sell uh, when you liquidate the stock. And the capital gains yield, again, is a uh, percentage, uh, is the capital gain divided by the purchase price. That's, again, a return on your investment. 
the total return is the dividend yield plus the capital gains yield. So you get two forms of return, dividend and capital gain. Uh, the tax consequences are important uh, and, uh, and uh, as well as the total return. So different types of stock, you can expect the components to be different. So a growth stock will have a higher capital gain component compared to an income stock, an income stock with a higher dividend yield component. The tax implication on the different forms of return are that dividends are taxed as income, whereas capital gains uh, typically tax at a different rate. So if you hold on to the stuff for one more, for yet longer than a year, uh, you the tax capital gain will be taxed at the long-term capital gains tax rate, which is typically lower. So if you buy a growth stock, uh, even though your total return may be the same as an income stock, but the tax implication can be different. We had talked about the trade-off between risk and return. So now that you understand return, it's important to look into the risk of investing in stocks. A very common measure of risk is the market risk, or it's called systematic risk. Uh, sometimes this is called beta. Uh, you uh, the beta of the market is uh, standardized to one. So a lot of times when we look at a stock, and we look at the risk of the stock, we are really talking about the risk of the stock relative to the overall stock market. So remember that the overall stock market itself is quite risky. Uh, we have looked at that um, in the history of returns earlier. And therefore, when we say a stock is less risky than the market, it does not mean that it is not risky. It just means that it's less risky than the market as a whole. So for example, a stock that has a beta of one uh, will have the same risk as the market, but a stock that has a beta greater than one uh, means that it has a risk higher than the market. So let's take a more specific example. Let's say a stock has a beta of 1.2. That means it's 1.2 times higher risk in the market. So let's say the market goes down by 10%, then this stock will likely go down by 12% because 1.2 times 10% is 12%. It's not precise, this relationship. This is a statistical relationship, which means that on average, and average is a long time, uh, this, is, this will happen. But on a specific day, or a specific month, that relationship may not be true, may not be precise. But overall, day after day, year after year, this is what you can expect. So this is the systematic risk. In addition to the systematic risk, a company can will also face unique risk. Uh, the unique risk is unrelated to the market. So this is the unsystematic risk. Uh, an example of unique risk could be the health of the CEO or some or a lawsuit that is unique to the company, but not to the market as a whole, nor is it unique to the uh, nor is it common to the industry as a whole. The good news is that unique risk can be eliminated if you have a well diversified portfolio. In fact, diversification is very important when it comes to stock investing. When we talk about bonds, we said, well, with the treasuries, you really need to choose the maturity and do maturity matching. You don't have to worry about choosing one treasury over another treasury because they are all used by the United States government. With stocks, that's a very different story. Every company is unique and every company carries unique risk. And in order to eliminate those unique risks, you need to have a diversified portfolio. So how do we go about doing that? In order to create a well-diversified portfolio, you need at least 30 to 50 stocks in your portfolio. So in addition to having sufficient capital to create a portfolio of 30 to 50 stocks, you also need to pay attention to stock selection and portfolio management on a regular basis. Uh, the bottom line is that this is a full-time job and it requires a lot of skill and discipline. There are tens and thousands of individual stocks traded in the United States. So obviously we cannot talk about each individual company. However, there are ways to classify or group companies into categories. And the investment community have different ways to classify stocks and it's useful to know what those terms mean. Uh, one 
broad classification is dividing stocks into how they react to economic events. Uh, cyclical stocks are stocks that does better than average when the economy is doing well. And this stock will do worse than average during, during down times. And uh, so an example will be a company that make construction ma uh, machinery. Thing, Caterpillar, John Deere. This company make machinery that are used to do construction. And construction tend to be uh, higher during economic booms and slow down during economic downtimes. So these companies will be considered cyclical stocks. Defensive stock has nothing to do with defense or the military. Defensive stocks are stocks that will remain stable during the decline in the economy. And these are stocks that will not outperform during an up, uh, during an, an up market. Uh, a good example for defensive stocks are stables, uh, grocery stores, uh, fast food restaurants. Think about places that whose business is not affected by uh, how the economy is doing. So think of your day-to-day -day life, um, things that you consume, whether or not you're getting a bonus check or not. Those will be companies that are typically classified as defensive stock. Another way to classify stocks we already mentioned earlier, and that is the components of the return. So we already mentioned that growth stock is a stock that will, ha that will grow faster than average, and you expect them to pay uh, fewer dividends. Some of them may pay no dividend at all. Again, technology company and startup companies are good examples of that. Uh, investors expect that most of their return will come in the form of capital gain. And they expect the capital gain component to be much higher than an average stock. In contrast, an income stock is a stock that pays a lot of uh, dividend. And therefore, uh, that's what investor plan on their return being uh, delivered in the form of dividends. So that's another way to classify stocks. Some analysts classify stocks based on market size. You hear the term market cap a lot. Market cap here, cap stands for capitalize, capitalization. And the way that you compute capitalization is you take the price of the stock times the number of shares outstanding. So market capitalization has to do with how much the stock is worth or the company is worth based on its stock price and not based on revenue or employee or the other measures that you may think of. So again, market capitalization is share price times number of shares outstanding. So large cap stock is issued by a company that has market cap over $10 billion. So these are the largest companies. So they're called large cap. Mid cap is somewhere between two to $10 billion. And then small cap is company that is less than $2 billion. Uh, very few company has market cap less than $250 million. For those that are really, really tiny, they're called micro cap. And those are not oftentimes publicly traded, meaning that you cannot buy stocks, these stocks on the stock market. Remember that the most important thing about stock investment and investment in general is that there's always a trade-off between risk and return. So the higher the risk, the higher the return. And in fact, all these different types of classification can be used as a proxy for risk. We talk about beta or systematic risk as one measure of risk, uh, but this other classification can also be used as a proxy of risk. Uh, of course, a defensive stock that does well during downturn has less risk than a cyclical stock that does well when the economy goes up and does very poorly when the economy goes down. So that's higher risk. Um, similarly, growth versus income, a growth stock has higher risk uh, than an income stock. Um, the same for market cap, a large company will tend to have lower risk than a small company. So if you find companies that are large cap, that has a large market cap, they pay dividend regardless of the market condition or the economic condition, and they, uh, they can survive, they are defensive, meaning that they, do, they will survive economic downturns. These are companies that are less risky. In fact, uh, the investment community give this stock a special name. They're called blue chip stocks. 
blue chip stocks are basically large company stocks that have a strong history of dividend payment and they also have survived economic downturns in the past. So you can uh, so this classification is useful. Uh, just keep in mind the trade-off between risk and return. We're going to pause the video here. When we come back, we'll look at how do uh, professionals analyze stocks. See you soon.